Good morning, church. Welcome to worship on this beautiful fall morning. I was just reminded this morning that in 2020, we had seven inches of snow by now. So I'm sure this moves your heart in gratitude toward our God this morning, right? I guess it does for me. Um, as we are gathered together, as you know, one of our core values is to invite first and next steps with Jesus. And so we'd like to start our service by letting you know some ways that are coming up that you can also participate in the mission moving forward. Please turn your attention to the screen. Hi, I'm Hannah Collins, Director of Connection and Service at Community of Grace. Here are some next steps you can take at CGLC. Would you like to take the next step toward a deeper relationship with Christ and into the CGLC community? Catalyst is a five Sunday discussion group beginning today. It runs from 11.45 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. and includes a light meal. You get a chance to meet new friends and talk to the pastors about Jesus. Catalyst is also our pathway to membership. Childcare is provided. Talk to me at the orange wall in the comments if you would like to learn more. And you may have noticed the diapers are already piling up in the commons. Our annual diaper drive is underway. Please help us keep bottoms dry across the White Bear Lake area. It costs about $70 a month to keep your child in clean diapers and 16% of Ramsey County children live below the poverty line. And government benefits for these families don't cover diapers. This is why we prioritize this effort at CGLC. You can pour out love on these families by donating unopened packages of diapers in the commons or donate online and we'll do the shopping for you. Finally, we are offering an opportunity to lean into your relationship with the Father right here at CGLC. Join us for a spiritual retreat Saturday morning, November 11th. Set aside your morning to bring your heart to Jesus. The theme is Pour Perfume on Jesus' Feet. Member Chris Laputa will be leading us through time in scripture and prayer from 8.45 until noon. Please sign up at the information desk. Be sure to pick up your copy of The Current this morning to stay plugged in or find more information online at gracepeople.church. Have a blessed week, church. I also wanted to remind you that in our prayer chapel this month, the emphasis is on intimacy with God. There is a, an inventory in there that if, if you want to know different ways that you might be wired to connect with God specifically that's unique to you, you can take that inventory to think about different ways that you could uh, grow in your intimacy with God. So feel free to stop by the prayer chapel. Prayer is always available after the services. So with that, would you please rise as we join together in singing our opening hymn, O Worship the King.
gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 1 John 1 tells us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And trusting in that promise from the word of God, I invite you in this moment to silently confess your sins before your God. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Almighty God in his mercy sent Jesus to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the authority of scripture and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you by his promise that what you have confessed has been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we celebrate that promise, we celebrate by singing. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. The reading today is from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1, 3 through 5, 8 through 11, and 14 through 17. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, 
both Malon and Kilion, also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to, <clears throat> excuse me, to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. for today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 32 through 35. A crowd was sitting around him, Jesus, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. At this time, we would uh, like to send our kids to our His Kids Sunday School for today. If you would like to come on up to the front here, kids, and go off to Sunday School. Lord, may you bless these kids and their teachers as they learn and as they grow. Uh, you can come on up here to the front door, kids. And may the Lord bless the teachers as they continue to grow in their faith, even as they teach all together. Well, good morning. Welcome to those who are joining us in the Fellowship Hall and online today. There is an old story, this is not a biblical story, just an analogy of the theological imagination, that in hell there are huge banquet tables filled with food, but every person has hands with four foot long spoon and fork attached, and no matter how they try, they can't get the food into their mouths, so they spend their day screaming and frustration and anger. And in heaven, there are the same tables and the same food, and the same fork and spoon attached to people's hands, but all the people are joyfully reaching across the table and feeding one another. And in doing so, they spend their days rejoicing in the splendor and the joy of the feast. That's what love does, right? It transforms the situation. It brings hope. It changes things. When love is put into action, it makes all the difference in how the story goes, both for us and for those around us. The center of our understanding as Christians of who our God is is revealed in Jesus, in Jesus' sacrificial love put into action for our sake. The God who first loved us, who sacrificially sent his own son to redeem us, in turn calls us to trust him, to trust his good heart enough to follow him in faith. And our gospel lesson today in Mark, as a crowd was sitting around Jesus and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister 
and mother. So according to the Messiah, the son of the living God, the ones he claims as family are not those who share his bloodline, but those who share the same desire to do the will of his Father in heaven. Not those who look like him, but those whose obedience to God lead them to love like him. That's where our family resemblance comes from, in knowing God's love for us and in sharing together the desire to live our lives out of our love for him in faith. And people all over the earth have been grafted onto this family tree through Jesus' saving work for us on the cross, by his sacrificial death for our sin, by his resurrection into new life. He invites us to share with him the identity as family to him and to each other, made family by his grace, received through our mutual faith in him. And knowing this about the heart of our God is actually pretty significant as we engage with the book of Ruth today, written centuries before Jesus' birth, because in it we see what Jesus reveals to us about who God calls family has always been a matter of the heart of faith revealed in love. This little book, only four chapters long, is a wonderful, powerful story of people choosing to show their love for God by loving each other in sacrificial ways. And in doing so, all in the story are blessed, as are the generations that follow them. So before we dive in and see what we can learn from this Bible book, let's establish where it falls in the timeline. This story happened during the time of the judges. So after God set his people free from slavery in Egypt in the Exodus... After they received the law through Moses of what it looked like to be people of this God, after God used Joshua to settle them into the promised land, as soon as Joshua's generation died out, the next generation completely forgot the Lord and what it meant to be his people. And the last verse of Judges sums it up nicely. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. You can imagine how that went. <laughs> It was chaos. And in chaos, you need someone to take the reins. So God raised up judges to try and help the people figure out which way was up in an upside down world. Judges like Gideon, Samson, and Deborah. But during that time, while God's chosen people were largely, largely choosing paths other than the Lord's, meanwhile, we're given the gift of this little story of the book of Ruth where we see ordinary people just seeking to honor the Lord the best they can in good times and bad. And as a result, we see Ruth, who wasn't one of his people, choosing him and his path over all other possible ones, becoming part of the larger story of his people through faith. God brings hope and new life out of surprising places in this story. So if you have a Bible or if you want to use a pew Bible, feel free to follow along in the book of Ruth. Here we go. In Ruth chapter 1, we're introduced to a woman named Naomi and her husband Elimelech from Bethlehem who moved to Moab for a while because of a famine. And her two sons marry Moabite wives, Orpah and Ruth, and before the famine abates, Naomi's husband Elimelech dies, and shortly after, her two sons also die, leaving all three women widowed. And Naomi hears that the famine is now over in Bethlehem, so she, hears, she decides it's time to go and reconnect with her people at home. And she very sensibly suggests to her former daughters-in-law they do the same and return to their families in Moab where they'd have the support to figure out what comes next. And in doing this, Naomi is showing real self-sacrificial love. Because I'm sure she didn't really want to travel the 50 miles of mountainous terrain on foot through bandit country all alone. But although they both offered to stay with her, she told them to go home because she wanted what was best, not for her, but for them. Naomi knows the home she's longing for will receive her, but might not be as accepting of an unmarried Moabite woman. She couldn't offer any real hope of a life in Bethlehem for them. So out of love for them, she sends them home. And her daughter-in-law, Orpah, saw that Naomi was right. This was practical. And she had no wish to burden Naomi further. So when Naomi told her to go, she did what she was told because she loved Naomi. Orpah's love was shown in her obedience. But in Ruth, things play out a little differently. Ruth's love is shown in her disobedience. 
Ruth did not do what she was told because she loved Naomi. You see, love made her ask the same question that Naomi had asked herself. What's best, not for me, but for the person in front of me? So in love, when Naomi told her to go home, in love, Ruth answered, only if that home is with you. Sacrificial love. Now, if you've ever been in the middle of a battle between two people both trying to pick up the check at dinner, you know that settling who will let the other one give sacrificially can also be hard to figure out. But Ruth doesn't leave any loopholes. And Ruth 1, she says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Now, if you've heard any verses from the book of Ruth, you've probably heard heard these. It's a beautiful speech. But it's important to notice the pivotal moment in here that changes everything. And you might think it's when Ruth promised that Naomi's God would be her God, but if she left it there, just saying, I'll worship whatever you worship, That would make Naomi the decider of what or who would be worshipped. She would become the ultimate spiritual authority in Ruth's life. I don't think that would have set well with Naomi. But everything changed for both of them when at the end of her impassioned speech, Ruth actually spoke the name of the God she was vowing to honor. You see, when the word Lord is printed in your Bible in all capital letters, that indicates that the Hebrew word being used here is the name of God, Yahweh, the I Am. Ruth is saying, may Yahweh deal with me, be it ever so severely if even death separates you and me. And in this moment, it becomes clear that Ruth isn't talking about committing to just any God of Naomi's preference. She knows the one she's committing to follow by name. She knows his power and his authority, and she's placing herself under the authority of his name. And suddenly we see that Ruth's commitment to Naomi isn't just about her affection for her mother-in-law or some kind of moral impulse to do what she thinks is right. Something bigger is happening here. Through her years with this family, Ruth has come to know that she would choose to follow this God over any she'd known growing up in Moab. The moment she names the name of Yahweh in connection with her own life, Naomi concedes. They are no longer family by marriage or by blood, but faith now makes them family. And that's how, through her faith in God, Ruth's love, in turn, becomes God's provision of love to Naomi as well. So Naomi and her former daughter-in-law travel to Bethlehem, where Naomi hasn't set foot for a decade. But when they get there, it's a really good thing that Ruth is with her, because when she sees her friends again, who are excited to see her, Naomi collapses into self-pity, forcing her friends to stop calling her Naomi and start calling her Mara instead, which means bitter. And she basically shuts down into her own self-centered pity party, leaving Ruth to try to figure out in this land where she's never been how they're going to survive. But Ruth takes charge, telling Naomi that she's going to go look for a field to work in where she can follow the harvesters and collect whatever they leave behind. And the fact that Ruth knew to do this tells us that she had been learning. Because God commanded his people in Leviticus 23, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. You see, God's word said that God's people would provide this option for someone in her situation. So in faith, she went to look for it. She trusts Because God said. Now think about this. While Naomi's self-pity was bogging down whatever faith she had, Ruth is, for the first time, leaning into the promises of this God and seeking them in faith. And God is faithful to direct her to the one place where she's sure to find what she needs, the fields of a man named Boaz. Now remember, this is the time of the judges, so spiritually it was pretty hit and miss. But Boaz had his workers operating according to Leviticus 23, which tells us something. 
We first meet Boaz in chapter 2, verse 4. Ruth had been working in his field when Boaz, who is the landowner, stopped by the field to greet the worker, saying, Yahweh be with you. And they answered him, Yahweh bless you. That seems significant to me because I imagine not every landowner would drop by and speak a blessing to his field workers or have them immediately want to bless him back in return. Have you ever had a boss like that? One who sees you as a person who matters? Seems like that's the kind of boss that Boaz was. And this is when Boaz notices Ruth. And he asks, who's she? What's her deal? And the overseer lets him know she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She asked if she could glean in the field, and she's been working hard all day. So it seems like everyone else, Boaz knew Naomi by name, if nothing else, since she had been married to one of his relatives, maybe a cousin. So imagine hearing this. A widow of one of your cousins was back in town, and the only one supporting her was her foreign ex-daughter-in-law without a penny to her name, who is currently working in your field, gathering what your workers left behind. Boaz's heart is deeply moved in seeing her do this. He knows what a selfless choice it was for Ruth to choose to be here, working to provide for her former mother-in-law. He's moved. By the sacrificial love he sees in her, he wants to help her. So he goes and tells all the men in the field that she is under his protection. And then he goes to Ruth and he tells her to work only in his field for her own safety. And he tells her to work not behind the harvesters to just take whatever they leave behind, but to work alongside the female harvesters he employs and to take home anything she's able to gather. Now this is above and beyond what Leviticus requires. It's a gift out of Boaz's own profits, but without the feel of charity, because it's work. (laughs) But it's work she can do that will give these women independence and immediate provision for their needs. And Ruth is blown away by this. And Ruth, too, at this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Did you hear that? Boaz doesn't see her through eyes of prejudice as a foreigner. He sees in Ruth one who has thrown herself under the authority of the Lord his God. One who is caring for Naomi in the way that he knew God desired her to be cared for. And Boaz recognizes the family resemblance in Ruth of the God who calls his people to love like that in his name. So Boaz prays that the Lord would repay her, would richly reward her for the sacrifices she's made. And in doing so, he becomes the vessel the Lord will use to answer that prayer. So Ruth goes home with her arms full of food, and she tells Naomi that she worked in the fields of this really nice guy named Boaz. And for the first time since being home, hope starts to stir in Naomi. She sees God's provision at work here. Her faith in God starts to wake up again because Boaz, being from the family of Elimelech, is a possible candidate to be a kinsman redeemer for them. See, there's an Old Testament literate law that when a close relative falls on hard times, if possible, the family should buy their property to keep it in the family. And if that married man dies without children, his brother or another close relative is to marry the widow so any child born will inherit what he would have given them. Now serving in that role, of course, will cost the one who takes it on. The kinsman redeemer spends his own money to buy the land, and the first child in this new marriage would not carry his name but the name of the previous husband, and all of the property he purchased and managed for them would all be used in support of that legacy, not his own. It's basically a gift of buying back for someone else the name and the future possibilities that were lost to them in the death of that loved one. It's sacrificial. It's a love that seeks to redeem, to restore for someone else what had been lost. 
And technically, it should have been Elimelech's brother or the next closest relative who would take this on, buying back the property. And it should be Naomi that he'd marry. But Naomi is too old to have children to replace those who were lost. So she could have just been taken into the family, but she happens to have brought home her son's widow. And this makes a truly gray legal area here, Ruth being a Moabite, not Israelite widow, of Naomi's son. So Ruth's presence actually complicated knowing what to do with Naomi. It's not crystal clear who should be stepping up and to do what in this particular situation, which is probably why no one had. But when Naomi heard Ruth had met Boaz and he'd been kind to her, she saw this might be how God would provide for their future. So in chapter 3, Naomi figures, unless Ruth acts, no one's going to make the first move. So she instructs Ruth to go and find Boaz where he's sleeping by the barley, probably protecting the harvest, and to uncover his feet, which was actually a cultural sign proposing herself as a candidate for marriage. And Boaz seems both surprised and honored by this. He's quite a bit older than she is, and he wasn't expecting she'd want to marry him, but now knowing that she did... He told her he'd have to talk first to the closer relatives of Elimelech to be able to become the kinsman redeemer for the family by marrying Ruth. And that night he protects her honor as a man of integrity, but he waits no time getting things settled the next day. In chapter 4, Boaz seeks out the person who should have helped in the first place and reminds him Naomi is selling the family land, to which this person is quick to say, oh yeah, I'll take the land. But when Boaz reminds him, the land comes along with the responsibility to take on a Moabite wife, her former mother-in-law, and to manage and maintain her child's inheritance, independent from all his other holdings, the man says, you know what, why don't you do it? To which Boaz says, fine. And he announces to all those gathered, he will take on the responsibility to redeem the land and the family of Naomi by marrying Ruth. And the people rejoice. And they bless him. You see, just as Ruth was moved by the sacrificial love she saw in Naomi, just as Boaz was moved by the sacrificial love he'd seen in Ruth, so the community was moved by the sacrificial love they saw in Boaz to step up and provide for Naomi's legacy through Ruth. So they bless him. And Ruth 4, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Now that reference is actually pretty significant. Because Tamar's story is kind of a stain on their family honor. In Genesis 38, Tamar was widowed, and her husband's family, at Judah's order, kind of abandoned her because they were unwilling to make the sacrifices necessary to be kinsman redeemer. And in the end, she had to trick Judah in order to survive. And only after the fact did Judah realize he'd wronged her, but the story of their disobedient selfishness stood. But through Tamar... Perez was born, and Perez was the great, 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 great grandfather of Boaz. Which makes this a story of redemption all across the board. Because in being willing to voluntarily offer the sacrifice of becoming kinsman redeemer for this new generation of family, Boaz redeems not only the future that would have been lost to Naomi and Ruth, but he also redeems his own family name. The family formerly known for their selfish disobedience to God and refusing to provide for Tamar now becomes known as the family line known for obedient sacrificial love for the sake of another in whom the community rejoices. In sacrificial love, Naomi tells Ruth, go home. In sacrificial love, Ruth refuses. In sacrificial love, Boaz chooses to redeem their legacy and in turn redeems his own. And in doing so, they all are blessed, as is the community and the blessing extends for generations. Because the son born of Ruth and Boaz, the son of Naomi's legacy, was named Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. From the faith and sacrificial love of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer of Bethlehem, comes King David, the man after God's own heart. 
And through this line, David's line, God would send his son, Jesus, to become kinsman redeemer of all humankind. This is the Lord who takes under the shelter of his wings all those left lost and broken. The one through his costly self-sacrificial love comes to graft onto this family tree all who will place ourselves under the authority of his name. Jesus, fully human, fully God, entered into humanity to be our kinsman, redeemer paying the price for our sin, laying down his own life to do what was best, not for himself, but for us, buying back for us all the ground we'd lost since the first day of humanity's fall in the garden and giving us a new name, a new home, a new family with him forever. We have a redeemer. Jesus makes us family. So today I'd like to invite you too to place yourself under the authority of his name, the name above every name. Because the blessing doesn't end there, it begins there. When the will of God, our Heavenly Father, is lived in our lives in imitation of Jesus' sacrificial love for us, even through imperfect vessels like us, his grace through us becomes a blessing throughout the world. You see, the story of Ruth is a story of how sacrificial love lived for the other changes the course of many lives. Sacrificial love given freely when it hits a receptive heart has a domino effect. Starting with the sacrificial love of God in Christ who loved us first. When we, like chips off the old block, sacrificially love those in front of us in his love for them, that love begins to spread And it changes things, both now and forever. So may this little story be a reminder for us today that God sees and works through our little acts of love given in ways that take down spiritual strongholds and open hearts to see who he is. Jesus, teach us to love like you, to live the will of God, our Father. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you know we all too often forget who you've made us to be in your grace. We get selfish and unwilling to love sacrificially those who are hard for us to love. We forget the joy you want us to know in sacrificially giving your grace, your love to the other. So Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, open our imaginations to see how you want to use us in the simple things to show the people around us the love that you have for them, the kind of God you are, so that through our love, they may come to see yours and live into yours until all the world is transformed by your redeeming grace. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Would you please join me in professing our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we have the privilege of sharing in the meal our Lord Jesus gave us, a meal that reminds us of the power of his love for us that meets us when we are most broken, when we're most vulnerable, when we're most in need, that Jesus chose to give us the gift of his own body and blood, his sacrificial love for you, so that you can know now and forever that you have been grafted on to the family of his eternal, redeeming love. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please join me in praying the prayer Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. As we receive this communion meal today, the ushers will send you up the side aisles. As you come forward, we do have an offering plate there. If you have a physical offering with you today, you can leave it in the offering plate. And then proceed to the first station where there will be a bread or a gluten-free wafer of bread if you require that. And then you can move to the next station where there is both wine and grape juice. The wine is a deep red color on the outside of the tray. The grape juice is a lighter color in the center. After you've received the blood of Christ, you can proceed to the middle where there will be an empty basket to put your cup on the way back to your seat. Please come to the Lord's table. All has been prepared for you.
would you please rise for the benediction? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join in our closing